All right. Good morning. Thank you. It is good to be with you. And uh, um, yeah, Doug and the staff were up at a retreat up at Cascade. And so he was like, hey, it would really be helpful to me if I did not have to think about a sermon while I was doing that. So could you help out? So here I am. All right, so that's why I am here. Um, and Doug mentioned I'm creating this resource called the Listener's Commentary. I think we can put a picture with the QR code up on there. If you're interested in digging into the Bible just to learn it more, understand it more, so that you can live it out more, um, that's what this is. It's a commentary is a book that guides you through books of the Bible, like chunk by chunk, paragraph by paragraph. This is one you can listen to. It's audio, so it's on Spotify. It's on your podcast app, completely free. You can check out the website, listenerscommentary.com. Um, I've got 21 New Testament books done, um, so I'm almost all the way through the New Testament. So maybe another year and a half, I'll have the whole New Testament done. I like to call it Blue Jeans Theology. Um, it is uh, intended to be something that's very down to earth in the language of everyday life. So even if you're not a Bible scholar, not a Bible nerd, you can understand it. All right. So listenerscommentary.com, if that sounds helpful to you, check that out um, there at that website. <clears throat> all right. Um, we are as uh, Doug said, starting a new series uh, that is designed to uh, introduce you to, to who God is and what God is like. And uh, I moved from Tacoma, Washington to Boise a long time ago to go to college at Boise Bible College. And my like, first week of class, I'm this 18-year-old freshman kid, uh, super excited for Bible college. I walk into one of my first classes, and the professor was a guy by the name of Kenny Beckman. Kenny Beckman had been around the college like 40 or 50 years, and he looked like it, right? He's grizzled and wrinkled and been around teaching the Bible forever. And I walk into class. The class is called Survey of Bible Doctrine. First day of class. And Kenny, you know, takes his kind of you know, gnarly, grizzled old hand, points his finger in the air, and this is what he says. He says, the greatest aspiration that a man can have is to know God. The greatest thing you could ever aspire to is to know God. And man, that resonated with me. I'd been uh, introduced to Jesus when I was a high school student, and um, through a, a person I was working with, I got introduced to a book called The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer, and another little book called The Practice of the Presence of God, and those books set my heart aflame to like, I want to know God, and I want to follow God, and now here I am sitting in this class with this, you know, longtime Bible teacher saying, that's the most important thing you could ever do in life. And that's, that's really at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. To, to be a Christian doesn't mean you just come to a church service on Sunday morning, as good or important as that is. It doesn't just mean you're a religious person and you believe religious things. To be a Christian actually means that you walk with God, that you go about your life in loyal, loving partnership with God, Him loving you and you loving Him in return, and you're walking in His ways and doing what He has taught you to do. That's really what it means. It means to know God. To be united with God, that's fundamentally what it means to be a Christian. And this series that we're starting is really all about that. It's all about who is God and what he's like. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And, and so this series over the next three weeks is really central to your discipleship to Jesus. If you call yourself a disciple of Jesus or you're considering being a disciple of Jesus, this is at the heart of it. Like, Knowing who God is, knowing what God has done, knowing what he's like so that you can live in partnership with him. And so this is really central to your life and to your following of Jesus. Now, when we talk about God and we say, okay, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, the, the technical word for that, the technical word for God as three in one is Trinity. It's the word Trinity. Um, and yet, interestingly enough, that word doesn't ever show up in the Bible. Um, it, it's a kind of a historic Christian word, but it's not a Bible word. How did we get that word? Where did that come from? Interestingly enough, this week, Tuesday of this week, actually, my daughter and her five-year-old, three-year-old, and little one-year-old were coming over to the house Tuesday morning uh, for breakfast. I was at home, and uh, I heard them drive up. Little Wes, who's the three-year-old, I always hear him running up the door, Papa, Papa. I work from home. He knows I'm going to be there, so he's calling for Papa. Uh, I open the door. I hug Wes, and Briley, the five-year-old, comes running up to the door, doesn't even say hi. First thing she says to me is, Papa, 
How can there be one God and three? You ever wonder that? This is a five-year-old asking me that question. And it's an important question. Where did we ever get that idea, one God and three? Where did we ever get this word, Trinity? Where did it come from? Well, look, look at uh, just a few passages with me that help us see as the early Christians wrote about God, they wrote some things that then the Christians right after them said, how do we capture that? What do we describe that with? So let's start. Matthew chapter 28. We'll pick up in verse 19. A super well-known passage of Scripture. In fact, often we refer to it as the Great Commission. It, it really is Jesus' marching orders to his followers, to us as the church. But in the middle of it, he says something really important for our topic today. So look what he says. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore... And make disciples of all the nations. There it is. That's our marching orders, right? That's the mission that Jesus gave his church. And then he goes on to tell, how do you do that? How do you make a disciple? Well, he says, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all I commanded you. That's how you make a disciple, baptizing them and teaching them to obey Jesus. It's that middle phrase that is so important for our topic today. Look what he says, baptizing them in the, what does it say? Baptizing them in the name, singular, not plural, the name, one name, but then he lists off three different persons, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One name, but Father, Son, and Spirit. There's somehow some oneness going on, but there's also somehow some difference going on, right? Name, Father, Son, Spirit. You get other passages like this. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14 says this, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Here's the apostle Paul, right? Like before he met Jesus, he was a Pharisee, a Jew of Jews, Right? In his mind, there was one God, but now he can put Jesus, the man, and the Holy Spirit in the same sentence on the same level with God. The love of Jesus Christ, um, the, uh, or the, the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Somehow, they're all equal. They're all on the same level. They're one, even though they're different. Or you get another passage, Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says, However... You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of the Spirit of God dwells in you. But then look what he says. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, then he doesn't belong to him. Well, is it the Spirit of God or is it the Spirit of Christ? Yes. It's both, right? Like the, the Spirit has the same essence as God. The Spirit has the same essence as Jesus Christ. There is unity and oneness and yet distinction and difference. That's what the the official representatives of Jesus wrote like. And so then later Christians were like, well, what what word do we use to describe that, to capture that? Somehow you got Father, Son, Spirit, different but one. And the word they came up for for that was Trinity. That's where the word... it's, it, the basic idea of the word Trinity is tri-unity. Three, one. Tri-unity. Boiled down to Trinity. And that's what it's getting at. Now, we have to think very closely about what this means. If there is a Trinity, there is three in one, right? There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, right? We have to think very carefully about how we talk about that so that we don't accidentally become heretics. We don't want any heretics uh, to be a part of Stonehill. We don't want to have to burn anyone at the stake. That would be really sad. So we have to think very carefully about this. And so when we say uh, there's Father, Son, and Spirit, it's the Trinity, right? That doesn't mean like there's three different gods. We're not talking three different gods. There's one God, but then there are also three. So it's not three different gods. We also want to make sure we don't think that this is like one God in three different modes. 
one God like in three different expressions. That's not quite right either, right? That's like the breakdown of one analogy that sometimes had been used for, to try to explain the, uh, the Trinity is, is like water. Water can exist as liquid. It can exist as a gas, steam, or it can as a solid, ice. But that's one thing in three expressions or three modes. Well, that's not what we're talking about either. That's actually an ancient heresy called modalism. And it's like, well, no, that's not quite what they're talking about when you read the Bible either. Um, so what is it? Well, th this is the classic historic orthodox expression of the Trinity. It's this. It's that there's one God in three persons. One God, like whatever makes God God, one divine essence, like the essence of Godness, like whatever God stuff is, that's it. There's one God, one divine essence expressed in or shows up in or, um, you know, in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. It's oneness or unity plus plurality. That makes perfect sense to you, right? We got that. Uh, unity and plurality. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, one God, three persons. Um, it's hard for us to get our mind around it, true? And the reason for that is because, like, we're finite. We have small, little, finite brains. God's infinite. If we could totally grasp everything about God, then he probably wouldn't be God anymore, right? He's way beyond us. And yet, when we talk about um, how can there be, Papa, how can there be one God and three? It may be hard for us to grasp, but it's not illogical. It's not illogical. In fact, let me show you what I showed my daughter, or my granddaughter, Briley, when she came into the house on Tuesday morning. Um, picture a square. Get a square in your mind. Do you have a square in your mind? Now picture that you're living in flat land. Like you're only in two-dimensional space. There's no three dimensions. There's just, just two dimensions. That's it. So you got this square, and you're living in flatland and two-dimensional space. And someone comes to you and says to you, I heard about another realm. Another realm where there could be, there could be multiple squares in one. Where there could be six squares in one. And you're like, oh, that's impossible. That could never happen. You could never have, you know, six squares in one because you're in flat land. Everything's flat. There's only two dimensions. And yet us, living in a three-dimensional world, we know for a fact that it's possible. Six squares in one. Six squares that somehow retain the essence of squareness. A cube has the essence of squareness, and yet it's six squares in one. Now, if that's possible for a cube, I think it's possible for a divine being who's infinite and almighty, don't you? Not illogical, even if it's hard for us to, to get around. God exists in a different dimension, so to speak, where it's possible to have three persons in one. Just like in a three-dimensional world, it's possible to have six squares in one. And that's what we're talking about with the Trinity. One divine essence Three divine persons. Six squares in one, three persons in one. God, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, this is not just like some technical little theological exercise for those people who like those kinds of things, right? Um, it's not just like, well, if I'm going to be an Orthodox Christian, I've got to sign off on this Trinity thing, but who really cares about it? Actually, Believing in the Trinity, like understanding that, that this is like the most real person in the universe, the, the, the eternal almighty God, that this is how he exists is absolutely crucial to your life and it makes sense out of certain things in our world. Like, what is the background essence of the universe? You see, if, if God were only one, if God were only one, there would be a problem. How many of you heard that God is love? But if you're all by yourself, you can't be love. If you're all by yourself, there's no one to love, so you could never, at the core of your being, be love. Now, if somebody else popped into existence, you could maybe love them, but you can't do it or be it by yourself. So when we say God is love, that's impossible unless God is three in one. He's more than one. So that there can be love within the essence of his being. 
And when we talk about then the universe, is, is the universe full of dark, empty, cold, impersonal, bare space? Or is the background of the universe, the thing that fills the whole universe, a divine person who just radiates and overflows with the energy of joy-filled love because it's just part of who he is? Those are two very different kinds of universes to live in, are they not? One that's impersonal, cold, empty, and barren, or one that's full of a being who radiates this love between Father, Son, and Spirit forever and ever. Big difference in the world. And not only that, it explains, it explains something about you that you may have thought about, maybe you haven't thought about. Here's the reality. All humans, you included, everywhere that have ever lived, every single human being has this urge to know somebody else and to be known by somebody else. Like, solitary confinement is a punishment. Why? Because humans are made for, we're made for relationship. Loneliness is not good for us. We're made to be known and to know we're made for relationship. Uh, like human babies come into a family and they live with them longer than any other baby or child or offspring in the entire animal kingdom. Why is that? Because we're made for community and for relationship. Why is it that even though marriages oftentimes are hard and broken and don't work out in our fallen world, like men and women still long to be married? They keep doing it, getting married over and over. Even if it's difficult and even if it's hard, there's this, this, this thing within them that drives them for unity, oneness, and difference. Just like God is unified, one, and yet distinct and different. We humans are compelled towards relationship because we're made in the image of God. And God is three in one with this love and this relationship, this affection between Father, Son, and Spirit and being made in his image. That explains why we so desperately need relationship, long for relationship, crave to be known. And so the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit, this is central to what it means to be human. It's central to the nature of the universe. It's central to how we understand ourselves and our world. So it's absolutely critical. Now, when we talk about this, you got the Father, you got the Son, you got the Spirit. That's the classic order. In this series, we're actually going to kind of mix up the order. So today we're going to talk about God the Father for a little bit. Next week will be God the Spirit, and then the following week will be God the Son. All right? So today, let's just take a few minutes and talk about the fact that God is our Father. Like, God calls himself that and draws us into this relationship as father. Let's just read a couple passages. Galatians chapter 4, one of these key texts where we hear this language. Here's what it says. It's talking about Jesus coming into the world uh, to draw us back to God. And it says this, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. That is the Old Testament law. He was born as a Jew, in other words, so that he might redeem, that is rescue and set free. He might uh, redeem those who were under the law that we might become, uh, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Do you hear that? That one of the purposes that God sent Jesus in the world was so that we could actually be adopted into his family, that we could wear that name son or that name daughter in relationship to God. We're welcomed back into the family. Like Jesus came for that reason, so that we could be family with God. So we might receive the adoption as sons. And then he goes on in verse 6 and says, because you are sons, because you are daughters, because you're God's children is the idea, God has sent the spirit of his son. Notice that we got God sending the spirit of his son. Once again, the Trinity is all involved in this. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying out, Abba, Father. What's Abba. Abba is, is the Jewish way that a son or a daughter would refer to their dad. It's just the word dad. It's, it's, the, it's the intimate way. Like, in a, you know, you don't, like, my kids don't call me father. They call me dad. Right? That's what Abba is. And the word father is just the Greek version of the same thing. And so in their world, there was, there was two groups of people. There were the Jews and there was everybody else. 
So when we use the Jewish word for dad and we use the Greek word for dad, what we're saying, it doesn't matter what your background is, where you've come from. If you're a human being, because of what Jesus has done, you have the opportunity to become family with God, to call God dad. Paul says the same sort of thing in another passage, Romans chapter 8. He says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. For if you have not For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption. Notice that. You're not welcomed into a family where you're like God's slave, where he just barks out orders and tells you what to do, right? And where you have to kind of live in fear of him. You haven't received that kind of spirit, but you've been welcomed, received um, into his family as a son or a daughter by whom we cry out, Abba, Dad, Father. That's the kind of relationship we're called into. When we enter into Christ, we now enter into this family. We're welcomed back into God's family. And this fact that God is your father, that's true both by creation and redemption. Like when we talk about creation, God, he's the one who made everything that exists. He spoke and and the universe came into existence. Every galaxy came into, every molecule came into existence. That God also, willed you into existence. That almighty person wants to be known as your father and he wanted you to exist and he willed you into existence and in that sense, he's your father. He brought you into existence. You exist because he wanted you to be here and thus he's your father. But it's also true by virtue of redemption. Like, that's what we're seeing here in Galatians 4 and Romans 8 is that Jesus came and laid down his life to open the way back to God the Father. That, that we, in some sort of way, had, had broken the relationship by whatever we had chose to do or we spurned his affection. Maybe we ran away from, tried to run away from God. But God, in his compassion and love, opened the way by sending his own son so that now we... When we come to Christ, get to call him Dad, Abba, Father. That's who God is. And so when Jesus taught us to pray, in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, we learn that this is how God wants to be known by us. This is how God wants to be experienced by us. Right? Romans chapter, or Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 says, Our Father who is in heaven, Our Father who is in heaven, like you're our Father, the one that's in the heaven, not the one on earth. You're our heavenly Father. Hallowed be your name. And hallow has the idea of like, I want to honor that name. I want to treat it with respect. I want my life to make sure everyone thinks well of my dad. That's the idea of hallowed. So we get to address God as Father, and we want our life to honor and respect him. This is intimacy and honor, right? Like closeness and deep respect. Like we so admire him and we so adore him that we want to draw near to him and we want everyone else to admire him as well. Intimacy and honor. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. This, Abba, Father, our Father in heaven, this is the language of intimacy and closeness and family and relationship. And what it means, it really gets at like access Right, like there's access and affection. Uh, Like like if I'm working and I'm busy and and maybe I'm even in a meeting and my phone starts to go off and I look at it and it's a text from uh, Ashley or Jeff or Joseph or Moon, right? If it's from one of my kids, right? Or, Or if I'm in the middle of a project and I'm working and I'm really, but all of a sudden my phone rings and they're calling, what happens? I answer the phone. If at all possible, I answer the phone. Why? Because they have a level of access that other people don't have. You could try to call me, and if I'm busy, I'll, I might just wait. Okay, I'll get back to them when I'm done with this. But not if it's one of my kids, because they're family, right? Like when Moon, who is now my daughter in law, was dating my son, she was working at Black Rock Coffee. Her shift was early. She was opening the stand. Um, She got up at 4 in the morning, and she had to be at work at 4.30 because the stand opened at 5. Uh, And all of a sudden, my my phone is going off at 4.10 in the morning. Why? Her car wouldn't start. 
It's four in the morning. I'm supposed to be sleeping. She calls me, and I answered. And I got up and threw some jeans on and went and picked her up and took her to work. Why? She's my daughter. She's family. She has access to me that other people don't have, right? Um, I, I was sitting in a faculty meeting, and all of a sudden my phone rings, and it was my son. That's a little unusual that time of day. So I answered it in a faculty meeting. Stepped out, took the phone call. Um, he had just gotten in a car accident. Right? I answered the phone. He gets in a car accident. I asked him, are you okay? He said, yeah. I said, do you need me to come? He said, I think, I think I'm all right. He was 18, 19 years old. Uh, he said, I think I got it. And then all of a sudden, about 15 minutes later, he said, no, Dad, maybe you should come. I left the faculty meeting. Why? He's my son. He has my attention and my affection, right? He has access to me like nobody else. That's what it means to be a father. Uh, my daughter, like for the last, like almost three years, um, my morning gets interrupted for the last three years by my daughter. I may be itching to get started on work, doesn't matter. There's a 20 or 30 minute phone call that happens most Mondays through Fridays with my daughter. Why? Because about three years ago, she said, hey, Dad, I really need to get into, back into reading my Bible and praying. But she has two, at that time, two small kids. Now she has three small kids at home, right? And so it's a little bit hard. I said, well, the key to that is time, place, plan. So she came up with one. She's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the kids breakfast. While they're eating breakfast, I'll sit there and I'll read my Bible and say my prayers. I thought, win-win. She's reading her Bible and praying, and the kids are seeing her read her Bible and praying, which tells them it's important, right? Um, but what that turned into was this. She reads her Bible, and she says her prayers, and then she gets out her phone. Hey, Dad, I got some Bible questions. So for three years, the beginning of my workday, most Mondays through Friday, when I get that text, I call, and we have a 20 or 30-minute conversation about her day and about her kids and about how everyone's doing, what her plans are, and answering her Bible questions. Um, why? Because she's my daughter. She has access, right? She knows she can call me. She knows she can count on me. That's what we're talking about. God wants to be known by you with, in that kind of relationship, our father, our dad, right? And we can draw near and we have that access and he's available, right? He's, he's prepared to listen to us. Our dad who's in heaven. Now, the reality is not all of us grow up in a home with a dad we can count on. True? It's just a reality of our world. Maybe, maybe your dad was he was around, but he was aloof, distant, like not real affectionate. He didn't really express himself to you, right? Maybe, maybe your dad wasn't even around. Maybe your parents got divorced and you hardly knew your dad. Um, maybe your, your dad was just too busy and just didn't have time for you. Maybe, maybe, maybe you grew up in a home where your father was abusive or harsh or heavy-handed. And I get it. And when we hear God described as a dad, like we, we have a hard time, like I, I, I know, but I, I struggle with that because of whatever happened to me. And the reality is, I get it. I get it. Because my earliest childhood memory is the night my dad walked out on the family. I was three and a half years old. I was sitting on the stairwell in our house in the north end of Tacoma, Washington, as my dad took my six-month-old little baby brother and handed him to my mom, grabbed his white navy duffel bag, flung it over his shoulder, and walked out into the night. And I remember sitting there. It was dark, and it was night, and it was raining, and I was three and a half. Between that moment and the time I was 20 years old, I saw my dad maybe four or five times. Grand total of probably no more than 10 hours from the time I was three and a half. Virtually no relationship with my dad. Um, I never had the, the thrill and the honor of having a dad look me in the face and said, son, I love you so much. I never had the experience of having a dad look at me as an adult and say, I am so proud of the man you've grown into. Never experienced that. 
I get it. And so when we, when we read passages like these that say God is our father, our dad, our Abba, right? Here's what really has to happen. What has to happen is we, we can easily, this is what shouldn't happen, we can easily take our experience of our own dad and let that reflect upon our experience of God. But what the text of scripture wants us to do is to go the opposite way. To say, what kind of dad is God? And let that then become the filter by which we evaluate our experience of our own earthly father. So what kind of dad is God? If that's going to be the standard by which we evaluate our own father, uh, experience of our father, what kind of dad is God? What's he like? Well, there's this fascinating little passage in the Old Testament where God introduces himself. He introduces himself to Moses. Um, it's actually a passage in the Old Testament where it's, it's the passage of the Bible that's quoted more than any other passage in the Bible. The most quoted passage of the Bible in the Bible. And so Moses is kind of calling out to God. Who shall I tell them? Rather, he's kind of called to God like, are you going to go with us or not? And God comes to Moses and describes himself. And then when the rest of the Bible uh, writers look back on that text, they're like, that's the key passage. That's what our Father in heaven is like. That's what God is like. This passage needs to shape our understanding of our Father in heaven. Here's the passage. Exodus 34 says this. Uh, God is speaking, introducing himself to Moses. And he says, the Lord, the Lord, or literally Yahweh, Yahweh. This is God's name, Yahweh, which means the existing one, the one who cannot not exist. Yahweh, Yahweh. And then he describes himself like this, a God compassionate and merciful, a God gracious and compassionate and merciful where he sees things from your perspective he understands your needs he understands your weaknesses he's gracious he's kind-hearted he wants to pour favor upon you he looks on you with favor Co gracious and compassion merciful where he aches for the things that, that you ache for where he feels your pain he's, he's sympathetic compassionate and merciful then he says, slow to anger. Like, this is not a father who you have to walk on eggshells around because you never know when he's going to just get angry and lose his temper, right? And some of you may have grown up at home like that where you felt like, man, they're always mad at me. Not this father. He's slow to anger, right? He doesn't get angry. He doesn't have a temper. He's slow to anger. And then he says, an abounding. Notice that, abounding. Not just a little bit. Not like, okay, we hardly got any. No, he's abounding. He's overflowing with steadfast, covenant, loyal love. The kind of love that says, I'm here for you through thick or thin. It doesn't matter what it is. It may be four in the morning, and, and, if, and if you need me, I'm here. Steadfast love, loyal love, reliable love. That's him. He's abounding in steadfast love and truth. And truth is probably better translated faithfulness here. It's this idea of being reliable and dependable. You can count on him. If he says he's going to do it, he'll do it. If he says he's going to be there, he'll be there. He is faithful, right? Abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness who keeps his steadfast love generation after generation after generation to thousands of generations all the way down the line. He just, that's just the way he is. He's constantly like that. Um, for a thousand generations, who forgives wrongdoing, and violation of his law, and sin. Like, he's forgiving. You do something wrong, this dad is not going to hold it over your head and constantly bring it up and constantly remind you and shame you. Of, you, you know, you're like this and you do that. Don't you remember that? No, he's forgiving and gracious and he lets it go and he wipes the slate clean. Yes, he'll hold you accountable. Yes, you know, sometimes that's just the way it goes, right? And the text goes on to talk about how he has to hold people accountable because you wouldn't be a loving dad if you didn't ever do that. But he's forgiving and he doesn't shame you and beat you up with it. That's who God the Father is. He's that kind of dad. Now, that kind of father who is gracious and loving and forgiving and reliable and dependable. And who wouldn't want a dad like that? So we have to look and gaze at this kind of God and say, all right, yes, even if our father was good, he wasn't perfect, right? Like, my dad's not perfect, right? We have to recognize it. But here's the standard. Here's what God the Father is like. And then that's to shape 
all our experience uh, of life itself. When we pray, our Father, our Dad who's in heaven, we're praying to a person who's like that. Loving, passionate, kind, doesn't get easily angered, right? Not temperamental, who's forgiving. That's our Father in heaven. So let me offer you just a key practice that, 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 that can transform your life. Like we're made in the image of God. And if God is love, this being of all this love existing from all eternity, and we're made in that image, then we're made to run on love. And the fact is, is when, when human beings don't get love early on in life and don't experience love all throughout their life, we don't work very well, do we? We're made for that, hardwired for that. So here's a practice. In view of who our Heavenly Father is, here's what I want to ask you to do. This week, every week, every day, once a day, twice a day, if you want to do it more than that, three times a day, do it as many times as you want, just for a few minutes at a time. Just stop as you go about your day. Maybe in those seam moments where all of a sudden you get a quiet moment in your day. Maybe it's in your car. Maybe it's, okay, you just wrapped up a project, and before you go to the next thing, just take two or three minutes. Just stop and gaze upon God as he gazes back in you at love. Like, look out at God as he looks on you with love and receive that love deep into your being. And that'll change your life. And there's, this, there's this phrase that shows up several times in scriptures that talks about, may God make his face shine upon you. That word shine is related to the word for smile in Hebrew. Like picture God in his love just smiling and shining upon you and gaze out at him and look at him as he looks back at you smiling and shining and loving you and receive that love deep, deep into the core of your being. That's who God is. God your father is that kind of father who wants to draw you to himself so that you can say, my dad who's in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your graciousness. Thank you for your compassion and your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that uh, you speak the truth to us. You lead us in the way we should go. Thank you that we can count on you, God. But draw us to yourself. Draw us into your love. Help us to listen to what your word says. And whether we feel it or not, help us to believe the truth of your word, that you love us with an everlasting love. Draw us into that, that we could be transformed by your love into the people you created us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.